passion, dedication, and inspiration. If you're ready to hear inspiring interviews with amazing trauma therapists, this is it. Right here, right now. With your host, Guy McPherson. Welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. We're going to get right into it today. Uh, today, I'm so excited to introduce my guest, Dr. Anna Baranowski. Anna, are you ready to go? I totally am, Guy, and thank you so much for uh, inviting me to talk to you and your audience as well. We are really thrilled about it. You are so welcome. So Anna is a board-certified expert in traumatic stress through the American Academy of Experts in Traumatic Stress. She's a Green Cross Scholar, a registered traumatologist and trainer. Her accomplishments include the co-development of the Accelerated Recovery Program for Compassion Fatigue, uh, as well as uh, presenting internationally on compassion fatigue, post-traumatic stress, trauma assessment, trauma therapy, and interventions. All right, Anna, that's obviously just a, you know, a little bit about yourself professionally, but take a moment, share with us something uh, personal about yourself, and then we will dive right in. Well, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's interesting. When, when you went through the listing of things, I just got an email this morning from my, my publisher who just told me that uh, the third edition of Trauma Practice has, uh, will be arriving actually for our Christmas gift for um, Dr. Eric Gentry and myself. And um, that's going to come out probably by December. And I just couldn't believe it. It was the funniest thing. A friend of mine said, did you, did you notice? what trauma practice is selling for online on Amazon. I, I became aware that um, there were no more copies of trauma practice available. So I guess somebody um, with a, a great entrepreneurial style <laughs> decided that they were going to start selling uh, copies because there were none available from the publisher anymore. And they were selling between 300 and $1,200. Oh and gosh. I was just shocked. But it's a really great toolkit, and it's been helping people all over the world. I know this, and I know that um, Eric's training about 10,000 people a year wow. in trauma practice. I know it's it's, it's actually unbelievable. Um, but, you know, we're um, we love the approach because we've found it has – made such a difference and i will tell you a story um guy because you 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 asked me to focus on something that was very real when i started in my career still as a student actually i became aware pretty early on that i was very interested in helping trauma survivors and one of my early cases i found myself with a young man who had been very severely traumatized. He grew up in a house where there was um, a lot of abuse. Um, his mom and dad um, were fighting constantly, but his father was an alcoholic and his um, tendency was when he was drinking to become very violent. And uh, mom, hoping to protect this um, child, well, the, my client was an adult when I was meeting with him, but um, when when he was a child, mom would put him into one of the kitchen cup, cupboards when dad would become violent. Now, you can just imagine how frightening it was for him because here he was hearing dad screaming at mom, and mom upset in the background, lots of noise, and he wouldn't be witness to it. He would just see it. As I said, this was mom's way of protecting him. And he would come in and explain these stories. And this was very early days in my career. I was still a student at that point, And I didn't really know what to do with this, you know, to, to help this person effectively. And it, it's interesting because my instinct was to listen and to be supportive. But I didn't have the toolkit or the framework to help me understand what I needed to do with this particular individual or really with any of the the, cl the uh, clients that I was being referred to. And I remember going to speak to my, um, my supervisor at the time. I would explain this story. And the supervisor basically said, you know, you shouldn't have been referred that client because this is a more complex trauma case. 
But since you've already started with this client, go ahead and continue. But I wasn't given a lot of guidance because at the time, the conversation about what to do with trauma clients was not sophisticated. It wasn't what we know today. We didn't have those skills, but it sent me on a journey of really trying to understand what works with trauma clients and what I could do to make a contribution to the field. Well, that's certainly a great story. And uh, I know myself, certainly, and I think our listeners are really chomping at the bit to find out what you did do and probably now what you would have done. But, uh, you know, we start out here, Anna, with uh, a quote, you know, and that's kind of something really to get us going, to find out what kind of inspired you on this journey, what kind of guided you. So do you, can you share with us a quote or a mantra, something that's kind of uh, guided you in, along this field? A quote or a mantra? Wow. Um, I'm not sure I have a very specific quote or mantra because I, I generally draw from so many different things. But, but what I do believe is that we are all woven with a mechanism to recover because if nothing else, from an evolutionary perspective, we, every one of us, Um, Can it be exposed to a trauma? And that trauma is the great human equalizer. So we have to have a mechanism for growth after trauma. And I just love the idea that we can embrace that growth. Yeah, I think that's such a powerful message for us to hear. And especially for... Uh, you know, clinicians who are just getting into this field or even as a reminder for those of us who have been doing this for uh, some time is is that, you know, you say we're all woven with a mechanism to recover. And I think having that understanding, having that belief as a therapist, right, coming into the room is such a powerful foundation from which to begin work. And it's the, being able to transmit that knowledge and hope to the client which again is so powerful too certainly is yeah yeah. so let's kind of move on here you know i think for not having a quote or mantra i think you did an excellent job there but let's (laughs) let's kind of move on here for um uh we get into a kind of a specialization you know this again and is about highlighting your journey uh to become a master trauma therapist and people get into this field for a variety of reasons. You know, I've often talked about one of my uh, influences and inspirations has has been my brother who came back from Iraq with PTSD. And, you know, I just did not know what to do. But what I did do is I just pestered him and asked him about his experience and just, and that was out of kind of a naive curiosity. But it it turned out to be the, 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 really the wrong thing to do. But Anna, take a moment, share with us um, what got you into this specialization of trauma. And I know, of course, you, you know you shared at the beginning that, that great story, but share with us if you want to elaborate on that but, or share another one, but what got you into this field? You know, life always offers us opportunities. We we don't necessarily have a straight path from here to there, as everybody knows and experiences. But I grew up in a household where there was extreme, very significant um, trauma. My parents had both experienced the most horrific traumas, my father particularly. And, um, you know, he was a remarkably gentle and kind-hearted man. So but I could see him suffering and struggling and you know I actually did something similar to what you did I I used to go for these long walks with my father and I I would be constantly seeing what what exactly happened to you um and you know he started to tell his story to me and it it made me realize that you know there that he really wasn't getting any kind of help at all and that you know, what, whatever help he was getting uh, didn't seem to be making much of a difference. I mean, that kind of laid uh, a path in my very um, young, young years, recognizing that, wow, you know, people can suffer from these terrible, terrible events. Why isn't there any way? 
for them to to get help that would really make a difference. And, you know, you flash forward many, many years, I went into um, psychology. And then I, I found that as I was doing my um, internships and practicum, I started to be exposed to other people who had trauma experiences. But at the time, there was very little recognition for um, approaches that really worked and made a difference consistently over time. And that just did not seem right to me. That kind of laid the, the pathway for me to really use all my focus and energy to figure out strategies that make a difference. And I was just passionate about it. I was dedicated to it. And, and because I knew personally the pain and the suffering that a person who is close to you can feel, I understood that it didn't have to be this way. And I was just so, so dedicated to see if I could make a difference in this field. Yeah, I mean that's such a great story, Anna. Thank you so much for sharing that. So even uh, you know, as you were a kid, how old were you when that was going on? When you... oh my god, no, I was really young. I mean, because my my father had um, uh, experienced um, terrible things before mm -hmm. I was even born. Mm -hmm. So you know, for me, I would hear him wake up at night, you know, having uh, night terrors, and you know, I could see the level of strain that he was experiencing. Uh, and you know, for a, a real kind of gentle hearted guy, my dad was, um, you Rick know, I could the see the, the, the depth uh, of his suffering. And when you have a real uh, loving father, of the, you know, my father was very loving, was, quote, you know, you, you can't help but look to that person that with a great degree of empathy and compassion. And I think it just kind of laid that kind of feeling down in me very powerfully so that I'm able to then bring that sense of compassion for the clients that I work with. So that piece comes um, through my own history, but the, the learning, all of that came later because it certainly wasn't, I mean, we don't know naturally uh, what, what it is that will help trauma survivors. That part did not come automatically. That was hard earned and through lots of study and investigation and trial and error. Yeah, I mean, again, I think it's just such a great story because it, it you know, points to our foundations as, uh, you know, individuals, as, as kids in a sense and what's going on. And obviously, you know, you said in, in relating your story, you know, jump forward or flash forward several years when you got into psychology. But, um, you know, we hear or I, I'm hearing that story again and again with the other uh, you know, really master seasoned clinicians that I'm, that I'm interviewing is that there was this foundation in varying degrees. You know, some people uh, ex obviously experienced trauma themselves, some didn't, but there's some exposure to it. But um, that leads to an involvement, like you said, you know, you got into psychology. And then again, Anna, again, most, if not all the clinicians I've been talking to started off when there wasn't, uh, or was, I should say, there was just the beginning of education and knowledge about, you know, PTSD recognized as a, you know, a disorder or, or a, a challenge or stressor and what worse. But um, I just think it's great. I mean, you, you can just hear the pa passion in your voice and the dedication in your voice. So um, thank you so much for sharing that one. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about your journey, what, what got you here in a sense. Let's kind of look at an early clinical error and what you learned from that. I mean, I think it's obviously, you know, crucial that we learn from our mistakes and we're all making them and have made them. But share with us one that you made early on, Anna, and how that well, influenced you. I, I want to go back to the first one that I talked great, about great. because it's it's actually the perfect example because what it did was it showed me not just what I didn't know, but what what the whole field seemed to be lacking at the time because I, I could see that although I may be giving this person some support, I wasn't seeing movement. I wasn't seeing this client move from a state of let's think about it from physiological level alone from physiological distress this client would walk into the office be in a state of panic because he knew he was going to try to talk about what happened to him and that's just all wrong 
that's not the approach at all. I mean, what what I would do today is something so different. But what I did then was I I would just say, you know, just just you know, talk about what happened. And of course, all I'm doing is making it worse because he's getting more physiologically uh, aroused, anxious, stressed. He's getting flashbacks. He's coming into the session. He's agitated and he's getting more agitated. Whereas what we really want to see is that somebody can actually come into the session, learn to harness calm, gain those stabilization skills before they go into the trauma storytelling. I mean, that just encapsulated so much for me in terms of not seeing this guy move out of his pain and distress and suffering and panic. That was just a catalyst. So, yeah, I mean, that's such a great story. And I think one of, uh, you know, an example that a lot of other people have shared as well. So for the benefit for our listeners, what, what would you have done differently now? Let's say someone walks into your office, you know, just super, you know, kind of, uh, you know, activated in a sense. Okay. So, so we know right now, and this really lays, um, the, the tracks for the trauma practice approach, which is, which is a tri phasic model, stabilization, working through trauma and reconnection or in, you know, more layman's terms, um, finding or harnessing calm or comfort, remembering your trauma, and then beginning to live again. And, you know, what I would do with every single client that I see today who comes in for trauma work is I always work on safety and stabilization. And in the trauma practice model, which um, this is the third uh, edition that's coming out, we work on many different strategies. Maybe it's um, a deep breathing process. Maybe it's a video stabilization process. So we we now have this um, uh, fully engaging um, 30-day video stabilization program where somebody can sign up for um, all of these um, videos and immediately they start to learn about breath training and shifting their focus and self-talk and uh, working on uh, comfort strategies of um, releasing tension and tightness in the body. That's all about safety and stabilization or harnessing calm. And just so if people are interested, they could sign up for the first 10 days free at whatisptsd.com forward slash find dash com and they'll be able to get uh, access to the first 10 days of the video stabilization program for free and um, so that's where I would start everybody safety and stabilization harnessing calm Mm mm-hmm Okay, yeah, that's great. And I've seen some of those videos and they're fantastic. And uh, I'll have a link uh, up at the show notes for that as well. Perfect. So what a great story. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, you're there you are as a, you know, an early clinician and you get assigned someone who, as your supervisor said, you know, shouldn't have been shouldn't have been assigned to you. And what do you do? But obviously, it's it's, you know, had a lasting impact on on what you do. So Anna, we get to one of my favorite questions now. You know, we've talked a little bit about challenges uh, that you've encountered, what got you here into the specialization. Now, I kind of really want to explore you know, why you keep doing this day to day. I mean, for me, I, I just love the question of why because I think it really inspires us and just empowers us to to move forward on a day-to-day basis so share with us share with our listeners you know why you keep doing this day-to-day okay so i've got two answers for that um i've had the incredible opportunity to see that individuals can actually do incredibly well and they do um And seeing that is largely my motivation because I can see the growth. And it reminds me of all the people who I have known in my life who have struggled with trauma and deserved 
to embrace growth in their life as well. And to know that I'm making a difference on that level, it's just really important to me because I know that it could be me, it could be you, it could be anybody who experiences real and significant trauma. And we all need to have a pathway to our recovery. We all need to have that laid out as easily as possible. I mean, the other piece of it is that I've had the great fortune of training thousands of clinicians around the world, both in class and online, because we have all of our courses at uh, ticklearn.com. That's T-I-C-L-E-A-R-N.com. And we have our full clinical traumatologist training online. And so part of the training program is that... um, the clinicians, by the time they get to the last course, they get an integrative component in which they have to submit their reports. And um, this includes a brief um, psychotraumatology evaluation report and a traumagram. And I hear from people all over the world Mm -hmm. about how they are integrating trauma recovery strategies for all of these people So we training the clinicians to do this model everywhere. And then I'm learning about the kind of positive uh, benefits that people are experiencing all over the world. How could that not be rewarding? Yeah, I mean, that's that's just so awesome. And, you know, I, I loved what you said initially as well, you know, because you're seeing this day in and day out. And, you know, of people getting better. And it also reminds you of the people you've known who've also experienced trauma. Um, that that uh, URL was Tickler's T. Can you run through that again? Yeah. T-I-C-L-E-A-R-N dot com. And all of our courses are listed. There. There's more than, I think there's over uh, 17 courses in full, including the, obviously the trauma treatment online program, um, which is available for people who want to learn about trauma strategies and recovery. They get all those videos and they get um, access to a lot of different instructional uh, exercises that harness calm, stabilization, working through trauma and finding um, comfort or reconnection. So it's a pretty powerful uh, program for people who are either working with a therapist or haven't yet had a chance to do that. But it's not a a replacement for skilled, direct trauma therapy. Mm -hmm. It's adjunctive work. It's something to help them or help their clients or help individuals continue between sessions or learn about what they need to do to recover. Okay. And again, those will be up at the... Uh, show notes page at westcoasttraumaproject.com. Anna, you know, uh, as I said before, people who are listening to this podcast um, are in varying stages of their education. Some are uh, new clinicians. Some are, you know, therapists who maybe don't think that they've worked with individuals who've experienced trauma before and now want to begin their education. What advice would you have for people who just want to start getting, learning about uh, trauma-informed care and learning about, you know, what it means, what's needed to become a trauma therapist in a sense or to work with individuals who've been traumatized? Okay, honestly, I think your most important first step is to know how to take care of yourself because I've worked with a lot of clinicians, as I said, all over the world. The ones that are consistently uh, able to manage this work, which includes exposure to secondary trauma, you must know how to care for yourself. I never ask people to do anything that I don't do myself and I practice every single day to harness calm, to work on exercises that I know make me as well and strong as possible, because I don't think I would be able to do this work myself if I didn't do that. Um, So, you know, part of that is learning about compassion, fatigue, resiliency, but also part of it is just having daily practices, whatever it is. Some people run. I uh, have been practicing yoga for over 20 years. Um, Some people do Tai Chi. Some people um, go for long walks in the woods. Whatever it is that you do 
make sure that there's something in place that will give you access to the core of your being and your own stabilization because exposure to trauma, whether primary or secondary, can of course result in a massive ignition for you. And even the most skilled trauma practitioners are human first before anything else. Yeah, you know, I, I really love and appreciate the way you broke that down. Um, you know, you said take care of yourself kind of with a big exclamation point there. And you, you really didn't leave it at that, Anna, which I really appreciate. You know, you said obviously have a daily practice. But and this this is the thing that really got to me about what you said. Learn about compassion fatigue. But Go find something that gives you access to the core of your being and that promotes stabilization. That, to me, is the gold. That's the take-home here. Because I think self-care, and I've said this before, is just so easy to say, it's e but it's so easy not to do, right? But, you know, you are in such good company because every other, you know, master therapist I've said says the same thing take care of yourself and and as they've also said just as you've said that you cannot do this work unless you take learn to take care of yourself and what does that mean but having a daily practice so that i just love the way you put that so mm -hmm. thank you for that <laughs> mm -hmm. well it's it's so important because as i said you know working with some training so many um therapists nationally and internationally we don't want to lose the best and the brightest. Yeah, yeah. And when people don't do well, it's often because they have been so good at caring for others, but not so good at caring for themselves. Mm -hmm. And they've dropped the ball on that piece. And, you know, really, yeah. there is no way to continue to help others unless we help ourselves first. You know, that's why they say on the airplane, you have to put your own mask on before anybody else's. Right. right. <laughs> Breathe. Definitely. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so um, let's get to books here. You know, aside from your book, which is Trauma Practice, Tools for Stabilization and Recovery uh, by Ara, Anna Baranaski, and you said the new edition has just come out. What can you give us two other books, which whether trauma-related or not, or not, which have had an influence on you and the work you do? I have to tell you, Judith Herman's book was absolutely essential. It laid an incredible foundation. Trauma and Recovery in 1992 was, was published by Judith Herman. She was the first person that I know on record to have spoken about a triphasic or a three-phase model, safety and stabilization, remembrance and mourning and reconnection. And it has been fundamental in the work that we do because we realized without that triphasic model, we really lose perspective and we just start throwing um, different kinds of interventions at a person and that's not necessarily what we need. The other thing that I found very, very helpful was Wolpe's work on reciprocal inhibition. Now he wrote psychotherapy by reciprocal inhibition. And what we know happens with reciprocal inhibition is that we are teaching people how to relax and recognizing that without that component, they cannot do good trauma work. So when we think about the nervous system, we're really thinking about fight or flight and we're thinking about our um, capacity to tolerate strain and stress. Now, Wolpe's um, correct notion is that if somebody's trying to work through trauma, a trauma memory, and we bring it to the surface, and we pair that with relaxation, so you've taught your client how to relax, how to harness calm, and then you're giving them an exposure exercise. The body cannot be both distressed and relaxed at the same time. So when you expose somebody to trauma, their own trauma history trying to work through, and you teach them good stabilization, harnessing calm exercises, teach them how to lower the volume of stress. Over time, 
they're exposing themselves in some kind of process to the trauma while relaxing themselves. The body begins to extinguish the trauma and boy, that's power. And it lays a foundation for a lot of the approaches that are part of phase two in the trauma practice approach. And we have oh, 30, 40 um, different approaches in the new trauma practice book. But the, the other piece that we just added was called um, thematic map and release. And the reason that we um, put in this um, new and more complex approach in trauma practices, because we recognize that beyond the trauma memory itself, we also have the capacity to get hooked into a theme or a core belief. And this goes um, really into the whole idea of neuroplasticity, where we start to recognize that, you know, when our when our mind starts to hook onto a belief like this world is unsafe, um, we will then um, get stuck mm -hmm. in that thought. And the more we think about it, the stronger that thought becomes and and the the more likely that we get caught in that belief system so the whole field of neuroplasticity has become such a, a big deal in terms of um being able to shape our thinking and and um point us in a direction that we want to really reinforce as well um and that has been very very influential for me um you know as i um work in this field so I would say, you know, that these this area of work as well has been very influential for me. OK, so uh, two books there, Judith Herman's Trauma and Recovery, which um, we know well on this podcast and uh, Psychotherapy by Reciprocal Inhibition by Joseph M.D. Wolpe. Um, Anna, what is the best way for people to get in touch with you? Well, anybody can get in touch with us. We're, we're always happy to answer questions. And one of the best email addresses is info, I-N-F-O, at psychinc.com. That's P-S-Y-C-H-I-N-K.com. But you know what? The easiest way is to just go to whatisptsd.com forward slash contact and you can easily get in touch with us and remember we also have our weekly videos that are coming out on ask dr anna and uh, we're always happy to answer questions and to keep the conversation about trauma growth and recovery going forward awesome and is ask dr a dr anna is that on youtube it is ask okay. dr anna it's actually our our um youtube channel we have two but the the one that has the ask dr anna is what is ptsd um that's the channel what is ptsd okay. it's all one word and they'll be able to find the playlist ask dr anna awesome i'll put that up in the show notes all right anna thank you so much you've been awesome i just loved the stories you've told and really it, it, the way you did that i i felt was just so uh, informational and educational for a lot of us here listening. Um, your passion and dedication is just uh, infectious. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Oh, I'm so happy we got the time, Guy, a guy, and I know that we tried a little bit to uh, to make this happen. And again, thank you so much um, for inviting me and uh, giving me a chance to to hear your story as well. And the work you've been doing is phenomenal. So I'm so excited to to know that you're doing this and you're raising awareness about trauma growth and recovery as well. So thank you for your work. Well, thank you for that, um, and we will talk soon. Take care. Great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.